This is part two of the chapter two lecture notes. And <clears throat> we left off with, this is slide number 19. We were talking about how most of the atoms on the periodic table, with the exception of group eight, um, the noble gases, most of them have an outer electron shell that is not filled. Hydrogen needs one electron to be filled. Carbon, as you can see, has four in its outer shell. And since, um, since it has more than just one outer shell, it needs eight total. So it would need four more to be filled. Nitrogen has five electrons in its outer shell, so it would need three more. Oxygen has six electrons in its outer shell, so oxygen needs two more. Phosphorus has one, two, three, four, five, so it needs three more. And sulfur would be like oxygen. It has six and it would need um, six more. I'm sorry, it would need two more to be filled. So we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> let's go on and, and um, sorry, let's go on and talk about molecules and compounds and then we will discuss how atoms combine to form molecules and compounds. So a molecule is two or more atoms bonded together but typically um, a molecule can be two or more of the same type of atom or different. So molecule is two or more atoms bonded together. For example, um, two atoms of hydrogen combine to form a molecule, I meant to just highlight the hydrogen, but they combine to form a molecule of hydrogen gas. So H2 is an example of a molecule. It's two or more of the same type of atoms bonded together. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, a compound is going to contain at least two different elements bonded together. So all of these are examples of compounds. Um, first of all, um, sodium chloride is a compound. That's the two different atoms of sodium and chlorine. And then we have carbon dioxide, water, and then C6H12O6 is the formula for glucose. Um, so these are all different examples of a compound. So really there's just, um, there's, there's just one example of a molecule up here. Let me go to my pen. So the only true, um, sorry, let me say that again. There's one example that is a molecule and a compound. So um, all the rest of these are compounds, but they're not molecules. This is not a real big deal to me, whether or not you, you know the difference between the terms. Um, basically, I just want you to know that atoms combine to form molecules and compounds. Um, they're just combinations of atoms. That's, that's really what's important to me in, in biology. Um, but, the, but the true difference in a molecule and a compound is it's a molecule if it has two or more atoms, whether they're the same or different. So all of these examples are molecules, but only, the only compounds are sodium chloride, carbon dioxide, water, H2O, and glucose, because compounds must have at least two different atoms in them. Um, they can't just be like H2 or oxygen gas is O2, nitrogen gas is N2, so two atoms of oxygen make oxygen gas. So this would be a, um, a molecule, <clears throat> but it wouldn't be a compound. Okay, so um, the formula, the chemical formula basically tells you the, the type of each atom in the chemical, and it also tells you the number. I want you to pay very close attention to the formula for glucose because you will need to know that one um, definitely in this course when we cover uh, photosynthesis, when we cover cellular respiration. On the, in these chapters, glucose is a big, it's an important um, molecule. So anyway, um, the six in front of the carbon, in front of the C, indicates that there are six atoms of carbon, 12 atoms of hydrogen, and six atoms of oxygen in one molecule of glucose, okay? So that's what the chemical formula tells us is the number of each atom and the type of atom in that um, molecule. 
All right, so we're going to talk about chemical bonding, which is a strong attraction between atoms to form a compound. Um, <clears throat> in ionic bonds, we'll talk about these type of bonding first. Um, basically, you have two atoms that are charged, and they're attracted to each other because they have a charge. So what we call an atom with a charge is an ion. An ion is an atom that has a charge because it has lost or gained an electron. If an, if an atom loses an electron, it will have a positive charge. If it gains an electron, it will have a negative charge. So when atoms of opposite charge, a positive and a negative ion, um, are close together, they're attracted because opposites attract. Oppositely charged ions are attracted to each other. That attraction forms an ionic bond. So uh, sodium chloride is probably the best, most well-known example of an ionic compound. And it forms when you have an atom of sodium and an atom of chlorine. Well, you go back to the valence rule <clears throat> the octet rule about the valence shell. So this is a sodium atom, and it has one electron in its outer shell. So right now, we know it's unstable because the outer shell needs to have eight. Well, the shell right before the outermost shell is already filled with eight. So if we could just get rid of this one electron, we would have a filled outer shell. It would already be the second um, electron shell would be filled with eight electrons. So if this one electron can just be removed, can, if sodium can just lose it, then um, it will be stable. It will be stable. And it can lose it. And if it does that, it will take on a positive charge, a plus one charge. Losing one electron means that sodium will have a plus one charge. Now, chlorine has seven valence electrons. That's four, five, six, seven. So if we could just have this one electron from sodium transfer over here to the chlorine, then that would give chlorine eight, and it would take away this one valence electron from sodium, so it would leave eight in the shell underneath, in the second shell. And that would satisfy sodium and chlorine, and that's what happens. Sodium ends up taking on a, sorry, sodium ends up taking on a positive charge, that's supposed to be a plus, and chlorine ends up taking on a negative charge because it gains an electron. <coughs> And that's what you see illustrated here. You see that the sodium ion loses an electron, takes on a positive charge, and we represent that as Na+. And the chlorine ion gains an electron, so it takes on a negative charge. We represent that as Cl-. And together, they are attracted since they have opposite charges, and they form the compound sodium chloride. That's an example of an ionic compound an ionic bond, okay? Covalent bonds, which we see a lot more with our organic molecules, like our carbohydrates and our proteins and our fats or lipids. Covalent bonds result from the sharing of electrons. Instead of transferring an electron from one to the other, the atoms will share electrons. For the same reason, they're still trying to complete their outer shell of electrons. So, um, for example, each hydrogen atom in hydrogen gas has one electron, but when they come close enough together to where they can share with each other, they each have two. And their first energy level or their first electron shell is complete with two electrons. Um, we represent that by a single line between the two H's. That shows you that it's two electrons being shared. Now, oxygen has, like, let's just look at the oxygen on the left. The oxygen on the left has one, two, three, four, and then we'll just say these two, five, six. It has six valence shell electrons, so it needs two more. So if the oxygen on the right shares its um, 
two of its electrons with the oxygen on the left. If they share two electrons with each other, which is a total of four, that is two pairs of electrons. We represent that with two lines instead of a single line. It's called a double, a double covalent bond. But um, by doing that, they each have eight. They each have a total of eight electrons in their valence shell. <clears throat> Okay, going back to covalent bonds result when atoms share electrons. If we call it a nonpolar covalent bond, that means the electrons are shared equally between the atoms. Each atom shares the electrons equally. They have an equal pull on the electrons. So hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, methane, these are examples of covalent, uh, nonpolar covalent bonds. But we also have covalent um, bonds that we call polar, and that is because sometimes, even though the electrons are shared, they're not shared equally. So a polar covalent bond results when electrons are shared unequally, and water is probably our most well-known example of polar, a polar covalent compound. Um, so in water, the oxygen atom is more electronegative. That means it has a stronger pull on the electrons than the hydrogen atoms. And so that makes the covalent bond polar. All right, and we can see that here, that the oxygen end, here's our water molecule. We have oxygen bonded to two hydrogen atoms. And the oxygen end of the molecule is slightly negative and the hydrogen end is slightly positive, and that's where the term polar comes from. So that leads us to talking about the chemistry of water. We First of all, we know water is a polar covalent molecule, and so that makes hydrogen bonding possible. So we, we talked about ionic and covalent bonding. Hydrogen bonding is different because instead of being a chemical bond that forms between atoms, it's a chemical bond that forms between molecules. Um, <clears throat> so basically it works like this. If you have more than one water molecule, the hydrogen end of one water molecule is going to be attracted to the oxygen end of another. So this is a hydrogen bond right here. Um, let, me, let me just show you another one. This is another hydrogen bond, okay? The oxygen end is slightly negative. The hydrogen ends are slightly positive. So the slightly negative end of one water molecule is attracted to the slightly positive end of another water molecule. And it gives water special properties. The fact that its um, water molecules are attracted to each other due to hydrogen bonding gives water a, a lot of properties that make it important in living things. So water molecules cling together because of hydrogen bonding. They cling together. Um, that gives water, hydrogen bonding gives water a high heat capacity. That means it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. If you notice how long it takes to boil water versus how long it takes the pan to get hot, that gives you an example. Um, the temperature of water rises and falls very slowly, and that helps water is, is a very good um, liquid to help us maintain our internal body temperature and keep it from changing. Okay, that's why we're composed of so much water. So water has a high heat capacity, um, and so water has also has a high heat of evaporation and that enables us to um, organisms to cool themselves by sweating. Water is a very good solvent. Because it is polar, it's, it dissolves other polar substances and also ionic compounds. So because water is polar, it makes it a good solvent. Other polar covalent substances dissolve in water easily, and also ionic compounds dissolve in water easily. So polar and ionic compounds dissolve easily in water. Uh, ionic compounds like salt. And make sure you know that a solution contains solutes which are dissolved in the solvent. The solvent is what does the dissolving, okay? Um, this is showing you water as a solvent. It's showing you how it dissolves um, salt in water. 
what it does is it forms a sphere. The water molecules surround the sodium.